We're working together to build your first FPV drone. And so far, we have assembled the quadcopter and we did a smoke check to make sure it was wired correctly and wasn't gonna light on fire the minute I plug in a battery. The next thing we gotta do is configure it in Betaflight Configurator, and that's what we're gonna do today. If you've stumbled across this video somehow and you wanna build your first FPV drone, there's a playlist down in the video description where you can get started from step one. On the other hand, if you're following along, let's get into it. And the first thing you're gonna to need to do is get Betaflight Configurator installed on your computer. And there may be some drivers that you need to install as well. I've got another tutorial video that I made where I went in depth into that topic. If you need some help getting that done, that's linked down in the video description as well. At this point, we're gonna assume that you've got Betaflight Configurator installed and you're ready to proceed. We're gonna need a charged up LiPo battery to power up the quadcopter here while we configure it. And you're gonna see me using this V-Fly short saver. I've got a link to my review of the V-Fly short saver down in the video description, as always, uh, if you want a better idea of what it does and why I'm using it. You don't have to have this, but it is a little bit uh, safer to be using it than not. The very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna update the firmware on the flight controller. This is almost always the right thing to do when you're building a new quadcopter uh, because you haven't set the flight controller up at all. So you're not really losing anything when you flash to a new firmware version. And there usually are bug fixes or feature enhancements in newer firmware versions that are good to have. If you know for a fact that there's a particular firmware version that you like to use, for example, if you've got Betaflight 4.2 on all 17 of your other quadcopters, maybe you'd like to go ahead and just put Betaflight 4.2 on this one for consistency. But in general, when you're building a new quadcopter, that's the perfect time to update to the latest firmware. In order to do that, we're gonna plug in USB here. And the very first thing we're gonna do is actually back up the flight controller configuration as it was delivered to us. So I'm gonna hit connect and I'm gonna to go to the presets tab and I'm going to click save backup. And that's gonna create a backup configuration file that I can use if I ever need to know exactly how the flight controller was delivered to me from the manufacturer. We're just gonna save that on my desktop, doesn't really matter. Now, if I open this file up, I want you to see that there is essentially nothing in here. If you're not used to reading Betaflight command line dumps, that may not be obvious to you. There's basically no changes in here from the default configuration. So there really wasn't much point in backing this up but it's still a good step to go through. For example, when we go to flash this flight controller, we're gonna need to know the board name and if you mistakenly flash your flight controller with the wrong board name, or it's also called the target. If you flash a flight controller with the wrong target, then the original target information is lost and it can be difficult to figure out how to get it back the way it should be. So if you're dealing with a bind and fly quadcopter that came from the manufacturer pre-configured, you definitely should back up the configuration before you update the firmware. But even if you're dealing with a completely blank flight controller that came from the manufacturer with nothing on it, except the defaults, you should still go ahead and back up the configuration. It is a good step to get into anytime you flash a flight control. So the board name in question is Xylo F4. We're gonna make a note of that, and then we're gonna go flash the flight controller. We'll do that by going to the firmware flasher tab. And then the next thing we can do is we can hit this auto detect button to try to automatically detect the board name or target that is on the flight controller. And in this case, it correctly picks up Xylo F4. We should still double check that against the configuration file that we saved just to make sure it gets it right. But Xylo F4 is what it's got. Now, the latest firmware version that we're gonna flash today is actually a little bit weird. We're in a little bit of a weird time frame. The latest actual release version is Betaflight 4 to 11. But Betaflight is just about to release a new version, version 4.3.0, and a lot of people are flashing the release candidate version of 4.3.0 because it's pretty much done. It has basically no bugs mostly, and people can mostly consider it safe to use. So I'm gonna enable this show unstable releases button and I'm gonna click release and release candidate here and I'm gonna flash Betaflight 430 RC6 is the latest version. Hopefully by the time you're watching this, 
an actual release version of Betaflight 4.3.0 is out, and that's what you should flash if that is available. In the meantime, I'm going to flash RC6, and if you're following along, that's what you should do as well. And then we're going to hit load firmware and flash firmware. Now at this point, if you do not see DFU in the upper right, then you may have a problem with your drivers. And again, back in that video that where I showed you how to install Betaflight Configurator, there are instructions about what to do if you don't see DFU and you need to fix your drivers. Once the flash has completed, we can go ahead and hit connect and Betaflight will ask us if we want to apply custom defaults and you should always do this, almost always do this after flashing your flight controller. And once done, we can connect again and we'll get another warning, which we will take care of right now. To get rid of that warning, we will go to the setup tab and with the quadcopter flat on the table, we will hit calibrate accelerometer. And now we can proceed with the configuration of the quadcopter. And the place we're gonna start first is in the motors tab. We're gonna get the motors spinning and get the motor, make sure that the motors are spinning the correct direction. Well, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna check that the ESC motor protocol is set correctly and DSHOT 300 is the value that we want. Uh, the ESC motor protocol determines what sort of language the flight controller uses to talk to the ESC. And you'll see there are quite a few of them. Most of these are historical in nature. They've just developed over time and slowly gotten better and better. The one that is used in almost all modern builds is DSHOT. And there are three different uh, versions of DSHOT, DSHOT 150, 300, and 600. And the rule of thumb is that you wanna use the highest DSHOT value that's available to you. In this case, we could use DSHOT 600, but because we have an F4 processor, if you look up here, it says uh, Xylo F4, STM32 F405. This is a little bit of a slower processor. It's one of the ways that the kit saved money. And so we have to use DSHOT 300 instead of DSHOT 600, and you'll probably never notice the difference. Now, the next thing I want you to do is enable bi-directional DSHOT and agree to this warning. And then we're gonna hit save and reboot. Bi-directional DSHOT is a function that improves the ability of the flight controller to filter out the motor vibrations and to make the quad fly smoother and better. That's the short version. You basically always wanna use bi-directional DSHOT if your ESC supports it, which most modern ESCs do. We can tell that the ESC supports bi-directional DSHOT by looking over here where we see the error percent and it should read 0%, but it actually reads 100%. In other words, the ESC is not talking to the flight controller. The reason for that is that the ESC is not powered up but if we plug in our battery and power up the ESC, there we go. Errors, 0%, and the flight controller and the ESC are talking to each other, fantastic. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna check our motor order and our motor direction. So in order for the flight controller to be able to fly the quad, the motors have to be in the position that the flight controller thinks they're in. In other words, when the flight controller spins the front right motor, it has to actually spin the front right motor or the quadcopter won't move the direction that it expects. And the motor has to be spinning the direction that the flight controller thinks because that controls which way the prop pushes the quadcopter. The way that we're gonna do that is we're going to first hit this button, reorder motors. I understand the risks, propellers are removed, do not have propellers on the quad when you do this because it's gonna spin the motors and it could cut something or damage something. And then we're gonna hit start. And we're just gonna click on whichever motor is spinning. So here we've got the back right. We're just gonna click the back right, front right, back left, and front left. And we will save that. We'll come back here and we will next do the motor direction. Now for motor direction, I find it helpful to have just like a little piece of paper or a business card or something or a, a dollar bill um, because it's not always easy to see or feel which direction the motor's spinning. Again, I'm gonna say I understand the risk, all propellers are removed and I'm gonna hit the wizard and I will choose to start spin the motors. And what's gonna happen here is all of the motors are gonna begin spinning and I'm going to look at this diagram and I'm gonna check that the motor directions match this diagram. So the front left motor, it should be spinning clockwise. It is not. You can see the way. So I'm gonna click, that's motor number four. I'm gonna click four and it will reverse four and now it is spinning the right way. Back left motor should be spinning counterclockwise. It is. Front right motor should be spinning counterclockwise. It is. And the back right motor should be spinning clockwise. 
It is not. And it is. So now we have all four motors spinning the right direction. We can just double check that if we want. Stop motors and close. There's one more basic check that we need to do to make sure that the flight controller and the motors are all sort of in alignment. And it's done here in the setup tab. I wish they had a wizard for this, just like they have a wizard for the motors. Maybe they'll do that in the next version of Betaflight. You may remember that we installed this flight controller with the forward facing arrow, not facing forward. How are we gonna compensate for that? And we can verify whether that's affecting the quadcopter by comparing the motion of the quadcopter in the real world with the motion of the quadcopter here on this 3D model. So if I tip the quad to the right, the 3D model tips to the right, to the left, the 3D model tips to the left. If I tilt it back, the 3D model tilts back and forward, the 3D model tilts forward. And then finally the yaw axis, left and right and left rather, it is moving. 100% correctly. That's pretty confusing because I definitely installed the flight controller flipped around backwards, but there you go. It's moving correctly, so there's nothing we need to do. Great, I guess. A little confusing, but okay. This section of the video is gonna be about setting up a DJI video transmitter. So if you're building the analog version of the quad, there is a table of contents and timestamps down in the video description below and in the uh, timeline. Uh, down below and you can skip ahead to the next chapter. For the DJI folks, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start by plugging in a battery to power up the DJI or Cadex Vista video transmitter. And we're gonna wanna look at this LED here and wait for it to turn green. Ah, there we go, good timing. Then we're gonna plug in USB and we're gonna make sure that we're plugging in the USB-C cable to the Cadex Vista, not the flight controller. Although the flight controller is a micro USB, so you couldn't really get that wrong, I guess. But what we're gonna to wanna to do is run the DJI Assistant 2 DJI FPV series app. Uh, you're gonna to need to download and install that in your computer. There's a link down in the video description below. Bear in mind, there are two DJI Assistant apps. One is the FPV series and that's what you want and one is not. And if you accidentally download the wrong one, what we're about to do won't work. When we run that app, we should see the DJI FPV Air Unit Lite. That's our video transmitter. And we're gonna click on that and we're gonna activate it. And basically all this does is associate this piece of equipment with your DJI account in case you need warranty service. And we see here that the firmware that's on it is 0606 and it's marked as current. Great, that's all we need to do. We just wanna make sure that we've got the latest firmware. If at the time that you're watching this video, there is a newer firmware, you should probably go ahead and update to it. Now, if you've just bought the DJI FPV goggles and this is your first time you're using them, you're gonna to need to do the same thing. Plug them into USB. Uh, the USB port is on the underside of the goggles here. Uh, power them up and activate and update the firmware if there is a firmware update. You also may or may not be using the DJI controller. Uh, we're gonna have instructions for setting up the DJI controller and for if you're doing a separate receiver uh, like Express LRS with the Radio Master Zorro. Um, if you do have the DJI controller, you will need to power it up, plug in USB, activate and update firmware as well. It's DJI, you spend your whole life activating and updating firmware. Next, we have to bind the video transmitter, the goggles, and if you're using the controller, the controller together, just so they know that they're supposed to work with each other. Uh, and we're gonna do that by plugging in a battery to the controller, or the, the video transmitter. And I'm also gonna plug in a battery and power up the goggles. Once the LED on the video transmitter has turned green, I'm gonna go ahead and press the bind button, which is right here. And the LED will turn red. On the goggles, the bind button is right here next to the power plug. It's this little red button here, and I'm gonna push it with a 1.5 millimeter driver. And that beep sequence will indicate that they have bound successfully, and the light on the Vista will go back to being green. If you're using the DJI controller, we're gonna bind that by first powering it up. Power it up with a short followed by a long press. And we're gonna wait for this LED to, there we go, now it is uh, powered on. If it just beeps at you, like beep, 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 it means that the throttle stick is raised. You need to lower the throttle stick all the way down before it will initialize. To put it into binding mode, there's kind of a weird key press you need to do. You need to press at the same time the record button here on the left shoulder, this unmarked face button, 
And this little scrolly wheel here also has a button that you press by pressing in. You're gonna push all three of those at the same time. And it will do that. And this LED will turn blue and it'll start beeping. And once again, we're just gonna press this button on the Vista and it will beep and now it also is bound. You should have a solid green LED. We can go ahead and power that down. The next thing we need to do is connect to the controller to the receiver on the quadcopter. This is a process known as binding and it basically tells the receiver that this is the controller that you should be listening to and not any other controller that might be out there in the world. The controller that we're using for this tutorial is the RadioMaster Zorro. And if you're following along with this tutorial, that'll be the one that you've got. You could be using a different one and the, and the steps that I'm gonna show you for setting up the controller are gonna be somewhat similar for any OpenTX or EdgeTX controller. So that's most of the controllers that are used in the FPV world. The screens may look a little different because I have a small screen and your radio may have a larger screen, but the general steps are gonna be the same. Now, in order to set up ExpressLRS, you're gonna need to use ExpressLRS Configurator. And just like I did with Betaflight Configurator, I'm gonna walk you through the steps, but if you want a more in-depth tutorial into ExpressLRS, including how to download and install ExpressLRS Configurator, then I've got a link down in the video description to my ultimate beginner guide to ExpressLRS. In the meantime, I'm gonna assume that you've got ExpressLRS Configurator downloaded and installed, and we're gonna proceed. And once the radio is powered up, we're gonna go ahead and plug in USB on the top of the radio. When you plug in USB, you're gonna be presented with this prompt and you're gonna use the jog wheel to choose USB serial debug. Next in Express LRS Configurator, we're gonna choose the latest release and oh look, it's 2.5.0. Oh good, there's a new version. Just time for me to update. For device category, we're gonna type Radio Master and choose Radio Master 2.4 gigahertz. And for device, we're gonna choose the Radio Master Zorro 2400TX. After you select the Radio Master Zorro as your radio, the next step is to select your flashing method. The flashing method we're gonna choose is EdgeTX Passthrough. The regulatory domain will be EUCE 2400 if you're in the European Union and probably the UK, uh, or anywhere else in the world, you're prob I think that ISM 2400 is correct, including the United States is definitely ISM 2400. And then you're gonna need to enter a binding phrase. This is a text string and it can be anything you want. It's kind of like a Wi-Fi password. Any ExpressLRS device that is flashed with your binding phrase will bind together. So we're gonna flash your radio with the same binding phrase. We're gonna flash your receiver. If you have more than one radio, you can flash them all with the same binding phrase and they will all sort of bind together. You make that, make that phrase up, you make it whatever you want and you type it in here. And then that is all that you need to do at this point. We're just gonna hit build and flash. Now, the very first time you flash uh, ExpressLRS, it has to download a whole bunch of stuff from the internet. And it may take five or even 10 minutes, depending on how fast your internet is, for it to download all that stuff. It normally only takes a minute or two to build, at most, to build the firmware, but the first time you do it, it will take longer. So you're just gonna need to wait it out. After a little while, you will see a message like this, auto-detected COM29 trying to initialize enabling pass-through. Uh, pass through done, and then you should see a message like this, writing, and then at the very end, it will say success, and you have flashed the firmware. Next, we're gonna download the ExpressLRS Lua script. A Lua script is a tiny little program that runs on your radio. Whenever you update ExpressLRS, it's a good idea to download the latest Lua script as well, because uh, sometimes it will have changed. The way we're gonna do that is we're gonna unplug USB to get out of debug mode, and we're gonna plug back in and this time we're gonna select USB storage SD from that pop-up. When we do that, two new uh, windows will appear. One of them will be named RM Zorro and will have firmware files in it. Close that one, don't touch it, don't mess with it. The other one will be USB drive, in my case it's drive F. And I want you to look at this contents, that is the SD card that is inside your radio. We're going to then click download Lua script here in ExpressLRS configurator and then we're going to navigate to that folder USB drive F and then we're going to go into the scripts folder 
into the tools folder and there we're going to save that file. And you can see elrsv2.lua is already there. We're going to overwrite that file with the new one. And that is it. At this point, we're done with the radio and we're going to move on and we're going to flash the receiver. And before we do that, we need to set the receiver up to talk to the flight controller because we're going to flash the firmware to the receiver through the flight controller. So if the flight controller can't talk to the receiver, it's not going to work. So we're going to go back into Betaflight Configurator. We're going to plug in USB and here are the changes we're going to make. We're going to go to the ports tab and we need to tell Betaflight what port, what UART number the receiver is connected to. We put the receiver on TX4 and RX4, you may remember, uh, so that is UART4. We're going to disable Serial RX on UART1 and we're going to enable Serial RX on UART4 and then hit save and reboot. In the configuration tab, we're going to make sure that the telemetry feature is enabled. We're going to save and reboot. And in the receiver tab, we are going to set the receiver provider to CRSF. That's the correct one for Express LRS. And we'll save and reboot. Now, at this point, the flight controller and the receiver should be talking to each other, but the receiver still has not been bound to the controller. Uh, and the way that we do that is by flashing firmware to the receiver. I want to acknowledge that my preferred way of flashing the receiver is not the way that we're going to do it here. If you go watch my full Express LRS getting started guide, you can see my preferred way of flashing receiver. I ran into a technical difficulty that meant that it didn't work. And rather than make you sort through that technical difficulty, I'm just going to show you a way to do it that does actually work. So here in Express LRS configurator, we will uh, set the firmware version. It's going to be the same as we selected previously. The device category is going to be Happy Model 2.4 gigahertz, and the device is going to be Happy Model EP2400RX. That's the receiver that we're using. The flashing method is going to be Betaflight Passthrough, and our device options are going to be basically the same as they were when we flashed the module. The same regulatory domain and critically the same binding phrase. If you don't put the same binding phrase there, then you will not be able to, they won't connect to each other. Once that's done, we're going to choose the serial device that our flight controller is plugged into. That's the same uh, COM port that appeared up here when we plugged in the flight controller. And we're going to need to close down Betaflight Configurator uh, so it's not running in the background and like trying to mess with that COM port and keep us from getting to it. We're going to select that COM port number here and we're going to hit Build and Flash. And sure enough, it has worked. We can see it is writing firmware to the uh, receiver and the LED on the receiver has stopped flashing. Once that is done, success. Now we have flashed the receiver and the controller to the very same firmware, and we can verify that, that they are going to talk to each other. The way we're going to do that is to power up the controller. Welcome to HTX. And then with the controller powered up, we're going to plug in the receiver. Plug in USB, the receiver will power up, and we should see a solid LED here indicating that they are bound and communicating. Now there's a quirk to Express LRS that you're going to need to be aware of, and that is that you should always turn on your controller first and then plug in your quadcopter. And the reason for this is that Welcome when you to HTX. the reason for this is that when you first power up the receiver, if it doesn't see the controller in about 30 seconds, the receiver will go into Wi-Fi mode. You can actually update the receiver over Wi-Fi. Um, and if it goes into Wi-Fi mode, then it won't bind until you power cycle it. So Always turn on the controller first and then plug in your quadcopter and everything should work fine. But if one day, like people complain, ah, oh, it's, it's Express LRS, man, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I bet what's happening is that they don't know about that. They're plugging in their quadcopter first, the receiver goes into Wi-Fi mode and then it won't work until you power cycle it. So don't let that trip you up. Now that the receiver and the controller are communicating with each other, I want to take a few minutes to set up the controller itself. And some of these steps are going to be a little unnecessary because the, the controller comes from the factory with a pretty decent factory configuration. But I want to make sure that we're on the same page. And so I want to sort of show you how to start from scratch. What I want you to do is long press the model key. And then I want you to scroll down until you see the first empty entry here. So for me, it's number two 
Um, I think the Zorro comes with a couple extra models that I'm not using. But scroll down to the first empty entry here and click the jog wheel and create model. And you'll get a new model and that model will have a star next to it indicating that it is the currently selected model. Next, you're going to press the page forward key here to go to the setup screen. And I want you to scroll the jog wheel all the way to the bottom of the setup screen to where you see internal RF. The mode for internal RF, you're going to set to CRSF. And when you do that, you should see that the LED on your receiver goes solid again, assuming your receiver is set up, uh, is powered on at this time. And then I'm going to press the return key to back out to the main screen. And now we have a completely blank, completely fresh model. You and I are on the exact same page and we're ready to proceed. Next, we're going to go back into Betaflight Configurator and we're going to check in the receiver tab to see whether our receiver is working. And we're going to do that by moving the sticks on the controller and we should see that these control channels move. That's amazing. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to verify that the channel mapping is correct. I'm going to move the throttle, which for me is the left stick, up and down, and the throttle does in fact move. I'm going to move the yaw axis, which is the left stick, left and right, and the yaw channel moves, correct. I'm going to move the roll axis, yes, correct, and the pitch axis, yes, correct. All are correct. The channel mapping is correct. The next thing to check is the end points. Uh, and that is when the stick goes all the way down and all the way up, does it move to the correct extents that the flight controller expects? And we can see that it does not. It goes to 988 and 2011. Um, and that is the same for all of these channels. Uh, the way that we're going to fix that is in the radio, we're going to long press the model key and we're going to page over to the outputs screen. And in the output screen, we're going to highlight channel 1, and we're going to long press and edit. And we're going to go down to the min and max parameter. Now, first of all, which channel is channel 1? You can see that when I move the aileron, the roll channel, left and right, we can see up here that this output indicator shows that that channel is the one we're moving. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the min and I'm going to click the jog wheel once, so min is flashing. And then I'm going to hold the, the roll stick all the way to the left so that the channel goes all the way down to 988. I'm then going to roll the jog wheel to bring that number up to a value of 1000. And then when that's done, I'm going to click there. I'm then move the stick to the right. I'm going to highlight the max parameter. I'm going to click the jog wheel and I'm going to roll that jog wheel until that value comes down to a value of 2000. So we've got the channel endpoints as 1000 and 2000. And that's pr pretty much 97.7 for both of them. Yeah, pretty much. So uh, an endpoint, a min and max of 97.7 gives us the correct 1000 to 2000 value that Betaflight wants to see. I'm now going to hit the return key one time and back out one time again. I'm going to go do the same thing for channel 2, 3, and 4. Each case, I'm going to lower and raise or move to the left and right the stick, and I'm going to adjust the min and max parameters so that channel has a value of 1,000 and 2,000. The good news is you only need to do this once, and then all the subsequent quads you build, you just bind them to this model and the endpoints are correct, but it's a little tedious the very first time you go through it. I should let you know there's a shortcut you can try and see if it works for you. If you highlight channel 1, which you've set up correctly, and click the jog wheel, you can try the option copy min max to all. It'll copy that min and max to all of your channels, and now we can just check throttle 1000 to 2000, yaw axis 1000 to 2000, roll and pitch 1000 to 2000. They're great. That, that worked just fine. It's not always going to be the case that all your channels will have the same endpoints, but a lot of times it will. And in that case, that shortcut will save you some steps. There are a few other changes I want you to make here in the receiver tab. One of them is to change the stick low threshold to 1010. The reason we do that is that the stick low threshold tells the flight controller when the throttle is all the way down and they set that value a little bit conservatively in case you didn't set your endpoints correctly. Since we've set the endpoints correctly, we can refine that number a little bit and it'll, um, it, it's a good thing to do. For the stick high threshold, we can set that to 1990 uh, and that's doing the same thing at the top of the throttle. And then we're gonna hit save.
The next thing I want you to do is long press the sys key, and this is gonna show us a list of those Lua scripts that are on the radio, those little programs that we installed the Express LRS Lua script. I'm gonna scroll the jog wheel all the way down until I see the Express LRS Lua script. By the way, don't be confused by the fact that there is also an ELRS Lua script on some radios. That's an older version of the script that you're not gonna use. They just include it in case you've got older firmware and need it. We want the Express Express LRS Lua script. And then when we run that, we should see this. Uh, one thing I want to call to your attention is that we have a C here in the upper right, and that tells us we are connected to our receiver. I'd like you to highlight the packet rate and click the jog wheel, and I'd like you to change the packet rate from 500 down to, mm, let's change that to 50. And the reason I say change that to 50 is that the That'll be back in a second. The reason I say change that to 50 is that the lower packet rate will give you a higher latency connection, but as someone who's building your first quad, you're probably not gonna care too much about the ultra low latency, but that lower packet rate will give you a much longer range and more, more penetration link. And I think for a beginner building their first quad, that's what the priority is gonna be. If you get to be a much better pilot and you wanna experiment with a higher latency link, I mean a lower latency link, uh, then you can raise that packet rate. The other change I want you to make here is to change the switch mode from hybrid to wide. And that will, uh, you can learn more about hybrid versus wide in my Express LRS tutorial. Uh, but uh, for now, just go ahead and make that change and trust me, that's what you wanna do. There's one more setting that I forgot to mention when I was originally doing this setup, and that is TX power. Uh, the higher the TX power, the faster the batteries on your radio will run down, but the more range you will get. I've got mine set to 250 milliwatts, and you're gonna wanna just glance at that if for some reason it's set down like at 10 or 25 milliwatts, you're, you're gonna notice a reduction in range and you may even fail safe. 250 milliwatts is more than sufficient for almost anything that you would wanna do, especially because we're running the 50 hertz packet rate, which gives us the maximum possible range. If at some point in the future, you decide to go for the lower latency, higher performance, 500 hertz packet rate, then you're gonna notice, you may notice a reduction in range. And at that point, you may want more output power. Some modules, not the Radio Master Zorro, but some modules can go up to, 200, uh, up to one watt. And that would be a case where you would want that. But as long as we're running on this lower packet rate, 250 milliwatts is gonna be plenty. Next, we're gonna go to our presets tab. And I want you to select the RC Link presets. And I want you to find the Express LRS 50 Hertz preset, which is right here. And I'm going to click on that. And we're going to choose for fine tuning, we're going to choose the Freestyle preset. With Betaflight 4.3, uh, you can refine the performance of the control link a little bit by choosing the correct preset. The defaults will work fine, but as long as you're following along with me, let's take the step to make it as good as it can be. Uh, and I would also like you to enable the single cell value voltage reading, and we will choose pick. Uh, let's pick a few more presets while we're at it. We're gonna to go to the rates presets and uh, I'm just gonna type Bardwell here, Joshua Bardwell rate. I'm gonna give you my freestyle rates and we don't need to select any option. We'll just pick this as well. And then we will hit save and reboot. While that's rebooting, let me take a second to tell you what Joshua Bardwell rates even means. The rates setting in a quadcopter controls how fast the quadcopter spins when you rotate the stick. So if I put, take this stick and I push it all the way to the right, is the quadcopter gonna go whoosh, 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 super fast like Mr. Steel, or is it gonna go slowly? For a beginner, obviously having slower rates might be better, but um, for the way freestyle pilots usually set up their rates is so that at the center stick, when you deflect the stick just a little bit, you get slow movement, but then when you fully deflect the stick, the quad moves a little bit quicker, which lets you do snappy moves. If you want something a little bit more conservative, you can go into the presets and you can choose rates and you can look for the 533 
533 heads up racing rates. Uh, these are rates by heads up FPV for racing. And you might think that racing rates wouldn't be good for a beginner, but be racing rates are usually low and precise because that's what racers want. So you might choose that if you want something a little more conservative. Next thing we need to do is set up our switches on the controller. And the way we're gonna do that, first of all, if you're still in the Express LRS Lewis script, hold down the return key a couple times to get back out to the main screen. Then long press the model key and page over to the mixer screen, not the inputs, the mixes screen. We're gonna scroll the jog wheel down to channel five we're gonna click the jog wheel one time. We're gonna scroll down to highlight source. We're gonna click the jog wheel one time. And the switch that you flick is gonna be the switch that is assigned to this aux channel. So we're gonna to need to think about which switches we're gonna use for which functions uh, because we may not use all of them. Uh, in this case, what I'd like you to do is flip the two position switch on the left shoulder. And when you do that, you'll see that source SE is filled in here. Just click the jog wheel one time so it stops blinking and then press the return key one time and again to back out to the mixes screen. And now you'll see that channel five is being controlled by switch SE. Next, we're gonna do the same thing for channel six. We'll highlight it, we'll click the jog wheel one time. We'll go down to source, we'll click one time so it flashes. And for this one, I want you to press this, two, this momentary button here and it will fill in SD. We'll click the jog wheel one time to accept. That will stop flashing, switch SD, and we'll hit return once and twice to back out again. And then for channel seven, I want you to go down to source, and we're gonna click this three position switch here on the right hand shoulder. And it will fill in switch SC and we'll click the jog wheel one time so it stops flashing and back out. And you're probably thinking, well, why do we pick those switches and not some other switches? And the reason is that I've been flying for years and I have a certain way that I like to set my switches and it's just how my brain works and I'm gonna just have you follow along with me. You can set any of these switches to control any aux channel and any function. And as you get more into building quadcopters, you may find that there's a certain way you like to do it that's different than this. For example, I use a two position switch to arm and disarm my quadcopter. Some people like to use a three position switch where the middle position is arm and disarm is pushing up or down from that middle position. They think it's easier to disarm if you don't have to remember which way to push the switch. That's not how I like to do it, but it could be how you like to do it. For now, just follow along. Now that we've assigned these switches to the different aux channels, you can see that when I move the switches, those aux channels move here in the receiver tab. So now the flight controller is seeing what we're doing with these and we can tell the flight controller what we want it to do when we move those switches. We're gonna do that in the modes tab. And here's how we're gonna set up our modes. Under the arm mode, we're gonna hit add range and then we're gonna flick the left-hand shoulder switch. We're gonna flick it towards us, and we're gonna grab this yellow bar, and we're gonna move that over so the yellow bar is on top of this little yellow tick mark. The way that the, this works is this tick mark shows us the current channel position. So as I move the switch, the tick mark moves up and down. By moving this yellow uh, bar, we're telling the flight controller when we want the mode, the arming mode to activate when the channel is in this position. So we want to arm when the switch is in this position and we will hit save. We're gonna add range for angle mode and I want you to flick this three position switch on the right hand shoulder and we're gonna put that in the middle position and we don't need to move this yellow bar at all because it's already in the middle position and we'll hit save. We're gonna scroll down. The next one we're gonna find is the beeper mode. We're gonna hit add range and we're gonna press this button. And you'll see that makes that little yellow tick mark go in the upper position, the rightmost position. So we want the beeper to activate when we press the button. So we're gonna move this slider over and we're gonna save that. And then we'll continue to scroll down until we find flip over after crash. We're gonna hit add range and we're gonna put this upper right hand shoulder in the position most towards us, towards us, and that's gonna put that in the rightmost or high position. And we're gonna drag this over so it covers up that tick mark and save. 
And then we're going to scroll all the way up to the top and we're going to hit hide unused modes to see all of the aux modes that we've set up and we can review what our switches do. So the default position is going to have all the switches pushed away from ourselves. Uh, when you first power up your radio, you can just make a mental note to just push all the switches away and that will be the default position for them. When we want to arm the quad to fly, we're going to pull this switch towards us and the quad will arm. If we want to be in auto level or angle mode, we're going to put this switch in the middle position. If we have the switch pushed away from us, we're going to be in acro mode or so we can do freestyle. There, by the way, there is no acro mode here on the modes tab. Acro mode is just the absence of angle mode. If we want to make the quad beep because we have lost it, we've crashed somewhere, we don't know where it is, we can hit this button to activate the beeper and it will beep. And then finally, flip over after crash, also known as turtle mode, is used to flip the quad over if it's crashed and it's upside down and you don't want to walk and go get it. And I can demonstrate how to use that later in this series. Now your aux modes are completely set up. If you're using the DJI video system, there are some Betaflight setup steps that are unique to you. Just like I've said other times in this series, if you're using analog, you can skip this chapter by using the chapter markers in the timeline or the timestamps and chapter markers down in the video description. And we're going to start here in the ports tab. And this is the setup for analog, which I did first. And now I'm going back to record the DJI stuff second. So your ports tab may not look exactly like mine, but the thing that you want to look for is I'm going to disable smart audio on UART 5. That's an analog thing. And instead on UART 3, I'm going to enable the MSP tick box. If you're using the DJI controller, there's one other change you're going to make. But if you're using the Radio Master Zorro with Express LRS, you will not make this change. And that change will be to disable Serial RX on UART 4 and enable Serial RX on UART 1. Only if you're using the DJI controller. And we will save and reboot. The next thing we're going to want to do is set up the on-screen display. And the on-screen display you see here is what I had set up for my analog video transmitter. It turns out that the DJI goggles only support certain on-screen display elements. So there's a separate OSD setup that I like to use for DJI. We can get that in the presets tab. We're going to hit preset sources and I have my own private presets rep repository or repo. You can find it here and you can access it by clicking add new source and put the name JB private repo and the URL, which is going to be this URL, which I'll put down in the video description and the GitHub branch is JB presets. You need to enter it exactly like you see here and then you'll hit make active and okay. And then once you get there, you should be able to find the preset JB OSD for DJI. We're going to click that. Uh, we do not have a GPS on this quad, so we do not need to enable the GPS option. We will just hit pick and save and reboot. In order to get the OSD working, there's a change we need to make in the goggles. We're going to do that by going to the settings menu, and then we are going to go down to display, and we're going to enable custom OSD. That needs to be on. And once you do that, you should see the OSD elements in the goggles, similar to what you see here in the OSD tab, but laid out a little differently because the DJI goggles are widescreen. Now the next part of this setup, you're only going to do if you are using the DJI controller. If you're using the Radio Master Zorro with the Express LRS receiver, then you'll skip this part. I'm going to go ahead and plug the... Uh, video transmitter in. You should always unplug the video transmitter when you're not using it because it gets kind of hot and it won't be damaged, but it's not good to have it just sitting there sort of cooking itself. Um, we're going to go ahead and plug that in and we're going to turn on the controller with one short press, then a long press and it'll power up. In order to get that controller working, we need to make the following changes. We're going to change the serial receiver provider from CRSF to SBUS and hit save and reboot. And at that point, you may or may not see movement here in the receiver tab when you move the sticks. If you do see movement, that's great. If not, there's another setting that we need to check. In fact, you should check this setting anyway because it decreases the latency of the connection and there's not really any downside to it. In the goggles, go to the settings menu and then down to device. 
In device, you're going to go to protocol, and you want to make sure that the protocol is set to SBUS baud fast. If you made that change in your goggles, you may not have any movement now here in the receiver tab, and there's a setting in the flight controller that needs to match. We're going to go to the CLI tab, and in the CLI tab, we're going to type set sbus underscore baud underscore fast. And you can see here, it's auto-completing that for me. So I can just hit the tab key on my keyboard to auto-complete that. But we're gonna type set sbus underscore baud underscore fast equals on. And then we're gonna type the word save. And at that point, the goggles and the flight controller should match and you should have movement in the receiver tab. Next, we're gonna go to the modes tab. And the modes tab is where you tell the flight controller what you want all these switches to do. Like one of the switches causes the quadcopter to arm so you can fly it. And another switch causes a beeper to go off. So if you've crashed and lost the quadcopter, you can find it. And basically there's these switches and you can sort of make them do whatever you want them to do. There's no really standard layout. Well, I've kind of got a standard layout that I like to use for all my quads and I'm gonna walk you through setting it up. So the first thing we're gonna do is hit add range here for the arm mode. The arm mode tells the quadcopter that you want to fly, causes the props to start spinning and the sticks to start making the quadcopter go. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this switch and we're gonna put this switch, we're gonna pull it towards us into the upward position. And when we do that, if I move that switch back and forth, you see this little yellow tick mark here move back and forth, showing us the current switch position. So I'm gonna put that into the upward position pulled towards me I'm gonna click and drag this yellow bar over so it's on top of the tick mark. And basically, whenever that tick mark is inside this yellow bar, that mode will become active. So what we're telling the quad, uh, the flight controller now is, when I flip this switch away from me, the quad should be disarmed. When I flip it towards me, the quad should be armed. The next thing I'd like you to do is click add range for the angle mode. And this front switch here, we're gonna put that in the middle position Angle mode is auto level. It makes the quad a little easier to fly, but you can't do cool flips and rolls. Angle mode is great for beginners to start out in. If you have experience flying in acro mode or freestyle, then you could choose not to use it. But I always set up angle mode on all my quads. I like it to be the middle position on this front switch. And well, that's exactly how it's currently set up. Next, we're gonna scroll down until we find beeper. We're gonna add range and we're gonna flip this shoulder switch here in the rear towards us. We're gonna drag this over so it covers that little tick mark. And there's one more, it's going to be flip over after crash. That is some, also known as turtle mode. It's used to flip the quadcopter over if it crashes and it's upside down. And I'll show you later in this series how to actually use it. But for now, just hit add range. And that is going to be the downward position on this front shoulder switch and we will drag this over to cover that tick mark in that downward position, and then we will press save. And my quadcopter has started beeping. Why? Well, if I go up to the top here and hit hide unused modes, I can see only the modes that I've actually set up, and that's because this switch, this beeper switch, is in the beeper position making me beep. So the rule of thumb for setting up a controller is that the default position for all the switches should be with the switches pushed away from you. So that when you first start the controller up, you just pick it up and you push the switches all away from you and you know that everything is in its default position, whatever you expect that to be. And then you, maybe you arm the quad or maybe you put the quad in angle mode or you make the beeper beep, it's up to you. Next, let's get the video transmitter and the camera working correctly. And the first thing I wanna do is just plug in the quad and see if the video transmitter is working you know, like it should be, right? And I'm gonna be using this handy dandy little screen which comes with the Emacs Easy Pilot, which I just reviewed on my channel to, let's just scroll through the channels and see if we can find, oh, there it was. I saw something. There it is. Ah, I got it. It is. Transmitting, our camera is working. That's a good sign. Let's proceed. Whenever I set up a new quadcopter, I go into the on-screen display tab and I set up the OSD elements to be the way that I expect them to be. On-screen display is essential for, well, for example, by turning on the battery average cell voltage, uh, and then we can drag it around and maybe we'll put it in the lower left corner or something. It's essential 
like knowing when your battery's about to be dead and when you need to land. There's a whole bunch of other information here, and uh, obviously we're not gonna go into every single one of these in today's video. Rather, what I'm gonna suggest you do is go into the Presets tab, and then you're gonna need to click Preset Sources, and you're gonna need to Add New Source. And when you add a new source, you give it a name and you give it a URL. And what you're gonna add is this name and URL that you see here. And I'll put this link down in the video description as well. You need to enter this text exactly as you show here. And then once you've added that source, you're gonna hit make active. And that is my private uh, GitHub repo for Betaflight presets. Once you've done that, you can find the JBOSD for analog and shark bite preset. And we're gonna choose PAL because I believe that's what this camera is and we're going to pick and save and reboot. When we do that, we should see, yes, fantastic, the on-screen display is set up just how I like it. Now, a lot of this stuff isn't gonna be immediately obvious what it is, especially if you're just getting started. And you may even wanna go through and turn off some of these things. Uh, you may wanna drag them around and lay them out however you want. That's totally up to you. But let me take you through a couple of these that I think you probably wanna know about. And probably the most important one is the battery cell voltage here down in the lower left. When that reaches about 3.5 volts, that's roughly when you need to come and land and not fly too much longer. The absolute minimum value is 3.0 volts, but somewhere between th about 3.4 and 3.0, it's going to just drop off a cliff. So don't try to fly it all the way down to 3.0. You won't make it, you won't, you'll, you'll damage your battery. Right around 3.5, 3.6 volts is when you should be definitely landing. The LQ value here is very useful for knowing when you are potentially about to fail safe. If this LQ goes below about 90, then potentially something, you, you, you're not really about to fail safe until it gets much lower than 90, but it should generally be close to 100% almost all the time. If you're seeing it get below about 90, then you should think about maybe getting coming home, getting closer, or maybe you're like flying behind a building or a tree and it's blocking your signal. Here in the upper left, we've got warnings. Uh, anytime a warning pops up there, that could be troubleshooting information that could tell you something is wrong with the quad. Some warnings are a big deal. Some warnings are not as big of a deal, but it's definitely good information to have anytime you're trying to figure out why something didn't go right. There's one more setting we need to fix in our OSD, and that is the craft name. If we go here to the configuration tab, the craft name is set right here, and I like to name that JB. Uh, Technically, that's my pilot name, not my craft name, but there you go. If I go back to the OSD tab, you can see the craft name now is in the upper right. If you have a longer name than two characters, you may want to drag that to the left somewhat and keep that on screen. One of the warnings that you're going to see as soon as you start to fly will be the RSSI DBM warning. And this isn't the video to go deep into what that is. But the reason for that is that the signal strength threshold for the flight controller is not correct for the Express LRS link that we are using. So if you're using Express LRS like I am, then what you're gonna wanna do is go into the CLI and type set OSD underscore RSSI underscore DBM underscore alarm. And you can see that autocomplete is completing that for me. I can just also just hit the tab key to autocomplete it equals minus 110. And you're gonna type that exactly as you see there. And then you type save, and that will set that threshold so that when you see the signal strength or the RSSI DBM alarm, it is actually a meaningful value instead of uh, nonsense. The other thing you could choose to do is just turn off the RSSI DBM alarm. Uh, and as I said previously, just focus on LQ to know when you're at risk of fail saving. Next, we've got to get our video transmitter working correctly. And a video transmitter can transmit on different channels and at different output powers. And in general, you want the highest output power you can get, but sometimes, especially if you're flying with other people or at a race, you'll need to turn your output power down to a lower value because it means you don't interfere with other people as much. As far as channels go, this is essential because if there are two transmitters on the same channel, then they will interfere with each other. And again, especially if you're flying with friends, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you're not on the same channels. I've got another tutorial about FPV 
best practices to avoid interference. And if you're getting into FPV, it is a must watch. And it's linked down in the video description with all the other reference links. For the time being though, we need to go into the video transmitter tab and the ports tab to set up the flight controller so that the flight controller can talk to the video transmitter. Because you see right here, at the front of the video transmitter are some buttons you can press. And those buttons will change the, the channel and the output power of the video transmitter. But who wants to do that? Reach in there and press buttons and stuff. Nonsense. There's a much easier way to do it and I'm gonna show you how to set it up. The first thing we gotta do is go to the ports tab and we gotta tell the flight controller which UART number we connected the video transmitter to. And as I look closely here at the pads of the flight controller, I don't see a UART number, it's just labeled SA for smart audio. That's the protocol that's used to talk to the video transmitter. So instead of looking at the pinout for the flight controller, I'm gonna have to look at the user manual and see if it tells me what UART number that is. Let's look in the user manual. And sure enough here, Smart Audio VTX is the SA pad and that is UART 5, TX5. Okay, no problem. So here for UART 5, I'm gonna go all the way to the right side to the peripherals column and I'm going to set that to TBS Smart Audio VTX and hit save. After that, I'm gonna to go to the video transmitter tab and I wanna look here and see device ready, yes, VTX type Smart Audio 2.1. If you don't see that, then something is wrong with your ports tab configuration or your wiring, uh, or maybe you just don't have the video transmitter powered up. You need the video transmitter powered up for this to work. Um, once that is true, then the video transmitter is talking to the flight controller. The next thing we need to do is load the VTX table, which tells the flight controller about the capabilities of the video transmitter. And we can find that here on the product page for the Xylo Stax VTX. Download the Betaflight VTX table for Smart Audio 2.1 integration here. I guess I will just control A for select all. Yes, and then right click copy, fine. And then here in the configurator, I'm going to click load from clipboard and it will fill in this VTX table. And if that didn't work for you, then maybe you highlighted the wrong thing or copied the wrong thing or didn't copy the whole thing, but that's basically what you need to do. And your screen should look like this and we will hit save. And once that's done, we should be able to change the band and channel in various ways. Hold on, let me get that screen back out. So here we are and we are on channel B8 for whatever that's worth. But if I go here and change the band to race band, channel eight, power 25 milliwatts, and press save. Oh, see, it's gone. It's gone over to channel race band eight. And, and there we go. Race band channel eight. Now we've picked up the signal again. Again, if you want to know more about what's race band, what's channel eight, and what all that means, there's a link in the video description to my video about FPV best practices. Check it out. Now it's all well and good to change your band and channel using Betaflight Configurator here on the bench, but when you're out in the field, you're not probably not going to have a laptop with Betaflight Configurator on it. I want to show you another way you can change the band channel and power, and it involves the on-screen menu of the flight controller. To get into the on-screen menu, we're gonna center the throttle stick, and we're gonna push the throttle to the left, or yaw to the left, rather, and pitch forward at the same time. And when we do that, this menu will pop up here. I'm then gonna use the right stick to go up and down the menu, and I'm gonna highlight features, and then I'm gonna go into that menu option by pushing the right stick to the right. I'm gonna go down to VTX, and I'm gonna push to the right, and in this menu, we can change the band, channel, and power. So we can see here, we're currently on race band channel eight. We could change that down to race band channel six, and our power level is 25 milliwatts. We could change that up to the max of 600, so we get maximum range. When we're done making those changes, we're gonna go to save, and push to the right, and confirm, and push to the right, and whoop, where did it go? Well, it went down to race six. Let me change this receiver here to race six, and uh, there we go. We're on race six. To get out of that menu, the shortcut is to push to the right with the left stick and choose save and exit. Now we'll save that setting so the next time we power up, it'll be on the same channel. We have darn near got a fully configured quadcopter. Uh, there's a couple other little odds and ends that we need to take care of. Here in the configuration tab, I want you 
to set the maximum arm angle to 180 degrees. The maximum arm angle prevents the quadcopter from arming if it's not perfectly flat and level, uh, which is supposed to be like a safety consideration if you're holding it in your hand. But if it's like set leaning on a rock or if it's on a hill or something, then it won't arm, and that's pretty annoying. So I just disable that particular setting. Uh, the D-Shot beacon configuration. I want you to enable both of these. Uh, what this is is we set up in the aux modes a buzzer switch. It was this shoulder switch right here. And I said that that was to help you find the quadcopter if you crash somewhere and you don't know where it is. It'll beep at you. Well, it doesn't have a beeper on it. But what we can do is that the motors can be made to beep. Uh, they act like a speaker coil. In fact, here, I'll demonstrate it for you. Yeah, that beeping that you hear when it first powers up, that's the motors. That doesn't, where's the speaker making that sound? It's the motors. And if I enable the D-Shot beacon, then when I press this button here, it'll beep and that'll help us find the quadcopter if we lose it. Now, the other thing you might think we were gonna do would be a PID tune, but frankly, Betaflight 4.3 PIDs, the defaults are really good. And I'd at least like to give this a try on the default PIDs before I go out and try and PID tune it. So maybe we will make that another video, but for now, we're gonna leave it on default. I think we've got everything set up and the only thing left to do is to button this guy up and then take it out and do a test flight. That's gonna be in the next video in the series. And when that video is out, I'll put a card on screen uh, to help you find that more easily and a link down in the video description to the playlist. This video is part of a playlist. I'll put a card on screen with a full playlist if you need to find the other videos in this series. I'll see you there.